If I'll do nothing out of bow, who can now day that you can't on your walls? Go and get your money, get a duffel bag, boy. Go and get your money, get a duffel bag, boy. Get money! <laughs> What's up, YouTube people? Shaggy the Writer coming back at you with the 17th installment. God, that's too many installments <laughs> of reading Oliver Twist live with Shaggy the Writer. Um, <clears throat> right now we are on chapter 49. <sighs> Monks and Brownlow at length meet their conversation and the intelligence that interrupts it. <clears throat> Before I get started, I just wanted to add to them. I'm probably going to try and combine all of these into like as few of videos as possible when everything is said and done. Uh, so hopefully you get the chance to watch this after the fact, uh, because I feel like there are very few people that would actually watch 18 individual parts of this. Uh, however, I'm trying to just do a couple chapters tonight and then finish tomorrow. Uh, so again, this is, will always be sub for sub, but you have to be patient and just let me know when you sub uh, so that way I can uh, come back at your end. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, chapter 49, Monks and Brownlow at length meet their conversation and the intelligence that interrupts it. The twilight was beginning to close in when Mr. Brownlow enlightened from a hackney coach at his own door and knocked softly. The door being opened, a sturdy man got out of the coach and stationed himself on one side of the steps, while another man who had been seated on the box dismounted too and stood upon the other side. At a sign from Mr. Brownlow, they helped out a third man and taking him between them, hurried into the house. This man was Monks. Hey, hey. <laughs> they walked in the same manner up the stairs without speaking and Mr. Brownlow preceded them, led the way into a back room. At the door of this apartment, monks, who had ascended with evident reluctance, stopped. The two men looked at the old gentleman as if for instructions. He knows the alternative, said Mr. Brownlow, if he hesitates or moves a finger, but as you bid him, drag him into the street, call for the aid of the police, and impeach him as a felon in my name. <clears throat> How dare you say this of me? Asked Monks. How dare you urge me to it, young man? Replied Mr. Brownlow, confronting him with a steady look. You are mad enough to leave this house. Unhand him. There, sir, you are free to go, and we to follow. But I warn you, by all I hold most solemn and sacred, that the instant you set foot into the street, that instant will I have apprehended on a charge of fraud and robbery. I am resolute and immovable. If you are determined to be the same, your blood be upon your own head. Boy, what authority am I kidnapped in the street and brought here by these dogs? Asked monks looking from one to the other of the men who stood beside him? By mine, replied Mr. Brownlow. These persons are indemnified by me. If your complaints of being deprived of liberty, you had power and opportunity to retrieve it as you came along, but you deemed it advisable to remain quiet. I say again, throw yourself for protection on the law. I will appeal to the law too, but when you have gone too far to proceed, do not sue me for leniency. When the power will have gone past into other hands, and do not say I plunged you down into the gulf which you have rushed yourself. Monks was plainly disconcerted and alarmed besides. He hesitated. You will decide quickly, said Mr. Brownlow with perfect firmness and composure. If you wish me to prefer my charges publicly, it can sign you to a publish the extent of which, although I can, with a shudder, foresee, I cannot control. Once more, I say, you know the way. If not, and you appeal to my forbearance and the mercy of those who have 
deeply injured. Seat yourself without a word in that chair. It has waited for you two whole days. <clears throat> Monks muttered some unintelligible words, but wavered still. You will be prompt, said Mr. Brownlow. A word from me, and the alternative has gone forever. Still the man hesitated. I have not the inclination to parley, said Mr. Brownlow, and as I advocate the dearest interest of ours, I have not the right. Is there, demanded Monks with a faltering tongue, is there no, no middle course? None. Monks looked at the old gentleman with an anxious eye, but readying his countenance nothing but severity and determination, walked into the room and, shuddering his shoulders, sat down. Lock the door on the outside, said Mr. Brownlow to the attendants, and come when I ring. The men obeyed, and the two were left alone together. This is pretty treatment, sir, said Monks, throwing his hat and cloak. From me father's oldest friend. It is because I was your father's oldest friend, young man, returned Mr. Brownlow. It is because the hopes and wishes of young and happy years were bound up with him and that fair creature of his blood and kindred who rejoined in God her youth, and left me a solitary, lonely man. It is because he knelt with me beside his only sister's deathbed when he was yet a boy on the morning that would, but heaven willed otherwise, have made her my young wife. It is because my sad heart clung to him, from that time forth, through all trials and errors, till he died. It is because old recollections and associations filled my heart, and even the sight of you brings with it old thoughts of him. It is because of all of these things that I am moved to treat you gently now. Yes, Edward Leaford. Even now and blush for your unworthiness who bear the name. <clears throat> what has the name to do with it? Asked the other after contemplating, half in silence, half in dogged wonder, the agitation of his companion. What is the name to me? You're nothing, replied Mr. Brownlow, nothing to you, but it was hers, and even at this distance of time brings back to me an old man the glow and thrill which i once felt only to hear it repeated by a stranger i am very glad you have changed it very very this is your mighty fine said monks to retain his assumed designation after a long silence during which he did jerked himself in sullen defiance to and fro. And Mr. Brownlow had sat, shading his face with his hand. But what do you want with me? You have a brother, said Mr. Brownlow, rousing himself. A brother, the whisper of whose name in your ear when I came behind you in your street was in itself almost enough to make you accompany me hither in wonder and alarm. Oh, I have no brother, replied Monks. You know I was an only child. Why do you talk to me of brothers? You know that is where is I. You were to attend to what I do know, and you may not, said Mr. Brownlow. I shall interest you by and by. I know of that wretched marriage into which family pride and the most sordid and narrowest of all ambition forced your unhappy father, when a mere boy, you was the sole and most unnatural decision. Oh, I can for not for our names, interrupted Monks with a jeering laugh. You know the fact, and that's enough for me. Oh, but I also know, pursued the old gentleman, the misery, the slow torture, 
the protected anguish and the ill-assorted union. I know how listlessly and wearily each of the wretched pair dragged on the heavy chain through a world that was poison to them both. I know how cold formalities were succeeded by open taunts, how indifference gave pace to dislike, dislike to hate, and hate to loathing, until at last they wrenched the clanking bond asunder and retired a wide space apart, carried each a galing fragment of which nothing but death could break the rivets to hide it in the new society beneath the gayest looks they could assume. Your mother succeeded. She forgot it soon, but it rusted and cankered at your father's heart for years. Well, I will separate it, said Monks. In what of it? When they had been separated for some time, returned Mr. Brownlow, your mother wholly gave up to con continental frivolities and had utterly forgotten the young husband, ten good years, who, junior, who, with prospects blighted, lingered on at home. He felt among new friends. This circumstance, at least, you know already. No, I, said Monks, turning away his eyes and beating his foot upon the ground as a man who is determined to deny everything. No, I. Your manner, no less than your actions, assures me that you have never forgotten about it or ceased to think of it with bitterness, returned Mr. Brownlow. I speak of fifteen years ago when you were not more than eleven years old and your father but th one and thirty, for he was, I repeat, a boy, when his father ordered him to marry. Uh, must I go back to events which cast a shade upon the memory of your parent, or will your spirit and disclose to me the truth? <coughs> I have nothing to these clothes, rejoined Monks. You must talk on if you will. These new friends, then, said Mr. Brownlow, were a naval officer retired from active service, whose wife had died some half a year before, and left him with two children. There had been more, but of all their family, happily but two survived. They were both daughters, one a beautiful creature of nineteen, and the other a mere child of two or three years old. What's this to me? asked Monks. They resided, said Mr. Brownlow, without seeming to hear the interruption, in a part of the country to which your father in his wandering had repaired, and where he had taken up his abode, acquaintance, intimacy, friendship, fast followed on each other. Your father was gifted as few men are. He had his sister's soul and person. As the old officer knew him more and more, he grew to love him. I would that it had ended now. His daughter did the same. The old gentleman paused. Monks was biting his lips with his eyes fixed upon the floor. Seeing this, he immediately resumed. The end of the hour found him contracted, solemnly contracted to that daughter, the object of the first true, ardent, only passion of a guileless, untired girl. The old tale is of the longest, observed Monks, moving restlessly in his chair. It is a tale of true grief and trial and sorrow, young man, returned Mr. Brownlow, and such tales usually are, if it were mixed of one with joy and happiness, it would be very brief. At length, one of those rich relations, 
to strengthen whose interest and importance your father had been sacrificed, as others are often, it is no common case, died, and to repair the misery had been instrumental in occasioning, left him his pantia for all griefs, money. It was necessary that he should immediately repair to Rome, whether this man had sped for health and where he had died, leaving his affairs in great confusion. He went, was seized with mortal illness there, and followed the moment the intelligence reached Paris by your mother who carried you with her. He died the day after her arrival, leaving no will, no will so that the whole property fell to you and her. At this part of the recital, Monks held his breath and listened with a face of intense eagerness, through, though his eyes were not directed towards the speaker. Mr. Brownlow paused and changed his position with the air of one who has experienced sudden relief and wiped his hot face and hands. Before he went abroad, and as he passed through London on his way, said Mr. Brownlow slowly and fixing his eyes upon the other's face, he came to me. Oh, I never heard of that, interrupted Monks in a tone intended to appear incredulous, but savoring more of a disagreeable surprise. He came to me and left with me, among some other things, a picture, a portrait painted by himself, a likeness of this poor girl, which he did not wish to leave behind and could not carry forward on a hasty journey. He was worn by anxiety and remorse almost to a shadow, talked in a wild, distracted way of ruin and dishonor, worked by him, confided to me his intention to convert his whole property at any loss into money, and having settled on his wife and you a portion of his recent acquisition to fly the country. I guess too well he would not fly alone, and never seen it more. Even from me, his old and early friend, whose strong attachment had taken root in the earth that covered one most dear to both, even from me he withheld any more particular confession, promising to write and tell me all, and after that to see me once again, for the last time on earth. Alas, that was the last time. I had no letter and never saw him more. I went, said Mr. Brownlow with a short pause, I went when all was over to the scene of his, I will use the term the world would freely use, for worldly harshness and favour are now alike to him. Of his guilty love, resolved that if my fears were realised, that erring child should find one heart, in whom to shelter and compassionate her. The family had left that part a week before, and they called in such trifling debts as were outstanding, discharged them, and left the place by night. Why or whither, none can tell. Monks drew his breath yet more freely, and looked round with a smile of triumph. When your brother, said Mr. Brownlow, drawing near to the other's chair, when your brother, a feeble, ragged, neglected child, was cast in my way by a stronger hand than chance, and rescued by me from a life of vice and infamy, what? <coughs> <coughs> cried Monks. 
By me, said Mr. Brownlow. I told you that I should interest you before long. I say by me. I see that your cunning associate suppressed my name, although for aught he knew, it would be quite strange to your ears. When he was rescued by me then, and lay recovering from sickness in my house, his strong resemblance to this picture I have spoken of struck me with astonishment. Even when I first saw him in all his dirt and misery, there was a lingering expression in his face that came upon me like a glimpse of some old friend, blushing, and one in a vivid dream. I need not tell you, he was snared away before I knew his history. Give me two seconds, I need to check my phone. Ugh. Stupid stupidity. Yay. Do 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 Who okay. or not? asked Monks hastily. Because you know it well. Oi! Denial in me is vain, replied Mr. Brownlow. I shall show you that I know more than that. You you can't prove anything against me, stammered Monks. I did for you to do it. We shall see, returned the old gentleman with a searching glance. I lost the boy and no efforts of mine could recover him. Your mother being dead, I knew that you alone could solve the mystery if anybody could. And as when I last heard, you, you were on your own estate in the West Indies, whither, as you well know, you retired upon your mother's death to escape the consequences of vicious courses here. I made the voyage... You had left it months before and were supposed to be in London, but no one could tell where. I returned. Your agents had no clue to your residence. You came and went, they said, as strangely as you had ever done, sometimes for days together and sometimes not for months, keeping to all appearance the same low haunts and mingling with the same infamous herd who had been your associates when a fierce, ungovernable boy. I wearied them with new applications. I paced the streets by night and day, but until two hours ago, all my efforts were fruitless. I never saw you for an instant. And now do you see me, said Monks, rising boldly, what then? Fraud and robbery are all sounding words, justified, you think, for a financed resemblance in some young imp to an idle daub of a dead man's. Brother, you don't even know that a child was born of this maudlin bear. You don't even know that. I did not, replied Mr. Brownlow, rising too. But within the last fortnight... I have learnt it all. You have a brother. You know it. And him. There was a will which your mother destroyed, leaving the secret and the gain to you at her own death. It contained a reference to some child likely to be the result of this sad connection. Which child was born and accidentally encountered by you? When your suspicions were first awakened by this re resemblance to your father, you repaired to the place of his birth. There existed proofs, proofs long surpassed, of his birth and parentage. These proofs were destroyed by you, 
And now in your own words to your, your accomplice, the Jew, the only proofs of the boy's identity lie at the bottom of the river and the old hag that received him from the mother is rotting in her coffin. Unworthy son, coward, liar, you who hold counsels, you whose plots and wiles have brought a violent death upon the head of one worth millions such as you, you who from your cradle were gall and bitterness to your own father's heart, and in whom all evil passions, vile and profligacy, festered, till they found a vent in hideous disease, which has made your face an index even to your mind, you, Edward Leeford, do you still brave me? No, 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 returned the coward, overwhelmed by these accumulated charges. Every word, cried the old gentleman, every word that has passed between you and this detested villain is known to me. Shadows on the wall have caught your whispers and brought them to my ear. The sight of the blue. Murder has been done to which you were morally, if not really, a party. No, no, interposed Monks. Oh, I know nothing of that. Always going to inquire the truth of the story when you overtook me. Or did you not know the cause? Or oh, thought it was a common quarrel? It was the partial disclosure of your secrets, replied Mr. Brownlow. Will you disclose the whole? Yes, I will. Set your hand to a statement of truth and fox and repeat it before witnesses. They are promised to. <coughs> <coughs> Remain here until such a document is drawn up and proceed with me to such a place as I may deem most advisable for the purpose of attesting it. If you insist upon that, I'll do that also, replied Monks. You must do more than that, said Mr. Brown. Make restitutions to an innocent and unoffending child, for such he is, Oh, the offspring of a guilty and most miserable love. You have not forgotten the provisions of the well. Carry them into execution so far as your brother is concerned, and then just go where you please. In this world you need meet no more. While Monks was pacing up and down, meditating with a dark and evil looks on this proposal and the possibilities of evading it, torn by his fears on the one hand, and his hatred on the other. The door was hurriedly unlocked, and a gentleman, Mr. Lowesburn, entered the room in violent agitation. Your mind will be taken. your friend, safe in the cave with you. He hurried off to where he heard this, replied the doctor, and mounting his whole solid mark and forth, to join the first party at some present outskirts agreed upon between them. And the Jew, said Mr. Brownlow, what of him? When I last heard, he had not been taken, but will be always by his time I sort of him. Have you made up your mind? asked Mr. Brownlow in a low voice amongst. Yes, he replied. Y you will be secret with me. Or will you remain here to your return? It is your only hope of safety. They left the room and the door was again locked. What have you done? Asked the doctor in a whisper. All I can hope to do, and even more, coupling the poor girl's intelligence with my previous knowledge and the result of our good friend's inquiries on the spot, I left him no loophole of escape and laid bare the whole villainy 
which by these lights become plain as day, Right and appoint the evening after tomorrow at seven for the meeting. We shall be down there a few hours before, but shall require rest, especially the young lady, who may have greater need of firmness than either you or I can quite foresee just now. But my blood boils to avenge this poor murdered creature. Which way have they taken? We'll straight to the office and we will be in time, replied Mr. Losburn. I will remain here. The two gentlemen hastily separated, each in a fever of excitement, wholly uncontrollable. Chapter 50, Pursuit and Escape. Ooh, this is a long one. Give me just a minute. This one is going to be tough. Oh, never mind. It's not as bad as I thought, but it's still pretty bad. Oh, boy. Let me check a few things. I'll be right back. Sorry for the inconvenience, folks. If you just give me a second. All right. Oh, boy. Okay, muffled screams. We're doing all right. Got a like. So here we are. 
Chapter 50, The Pursuit and Escape. Ooh. Near the part of the Thames on which the church at Rotherhide abuts, where the buildings on the banks are dirtiest and the vessels on the river blackest with the dust of colliers and the smoke of close-built, low-roofed houses, there exists at the present day the filthiest, the strangest, the most extraordinary of many localities that are hidden in London, wholly unknown, even by name, to the great mass of its inhabitants. To reach this place, the visitor has to penetrate through a maze of close, narrow, and muddy streets thronged by the roughest and poorest of waterside people and devoted to the traffic they may be supposed on occasion. The cheapest and least delicate provisions are heaped in the shops in the coarsest and commonest articles of wearing apparel dangle at the salesman's door and stream from house parapet and windows, jostling with unemployed laborers of lowest class, ballast heavers, coal wipers, brazen women, ragged children, and the very raft and refuse of the river. He makes his way with difficulty along, assailed by offensive sights and smells from the narrow alleys which branch off to on the right and left, and deafened by the clash of ponderous wagons that bear great piles of merchandise from the stacks of warehouses that rise from every corner, arriving at length in streets remoter and less frequented than those through which he has passed. He walks beneath tottering house fronts, projecting over the pavement, dismantled laws that seem to totter as he passes Chimneys half crushed, half hesitating to fall. Windows guarded by rusty iron bars that time and dirt have almost eaten away. At every imaginable sight of desolation and neglect. In such a neighborhood beyond Dock Heed, in the borough of Southwark, stands Jacob's Island, surrounded by a muddy ditch six or eight feet deep. and 15 or 20 feet wide when the tide is in, once called Mill Pond, but now known in these days as Folly Ditch. It is a creek or inlet from the Thames and can always be filled at high water by opening sluices at the lead mills from which it took its old name. At such times, a stranger looking from one of the wooden bridges thrown across it at Mill Lane will see the inhabitants on the houses on either side, lowering from their back doors and windows buckets, pails, and domestic utensils of all kinds in which to haul the water up. And when his eye is turned from these operations to the houses themselves, his utmost astonishment will be excited by the scene before him. Crazy wooden galleries common to the backs of a half dozen houses with holes from which to look upon the slime beneath, windows broken and patched with poles thrust out on which to dry the linen that is never there. Rooms so small, so filthy, so confined, that the air would seem too tainted even for the dirt and squalor which they shelter. Wooden chambers thrusting themselves out above the mud and threatening to fall into it, as some have done, dirt besmeared walls and decaying foundations, every repulsive liniment of poverty, every loathsome indication of filth, rot, and garbage all these ornament from the banks of Folly Ditch. In Jacob's Island, the warehouses are roofless and empty. The walls are crumbling down. The windows are windows no more. The doors are falling into the streets. The chimneys are blackened, but they yield no smoke. 30 or 40 years ago before losses and chancery suits came upon it, 
It was a thriving place, but now it is a desolate island indeed. The houses have no owners. They are broken open and entered upon by those who have the courage, and there they live, and there they die. They have... I'm sorry, give me just... Heck, I'm losing it already. <laughs> they must have powerful motives for a secret residence or be reduced to a destitute condition indeed who seek a refuge in Jacob's Island. In an upper room of one of these houses, a detached house of fair size, ruinous in other aspects, was strongly defended at door and window, of which house the back commanded the ditch in a manner already described. There were assembled three men, who regarding each other every now and then with looks of expressive perplexity and expectation, sat for some time in profound and gloomy silence. Of these was Toby Crackett, another Mr. Chitling, and the third, a robber of 50 years, whose nose had been almost beaten in in some old scuffle, and whose face bore a frightful scar which might probably be traced to the same occasion. This man was returned transferred, and his name was Cags. Oh, boy. Dan. Dan. Well, I wish, said Toby, turning to Mr. Chitlin. You had picked out some other crib where not two old ones had got warm. I had not come here all for a fellow. What did you run the head? said Keggs. Well, I thought you'd have been a little more glad to see me than this, replied Mr. Chitling with a melancholy air. Why, look here, young gentleman, said Toby. When a man keeps himself so very exclusive as you have done, there more means to have a stunt himself. This hang of the house, with nobody prying every about. A young short is in your order is to be from a young gentleman, time of respectable and pleasant a person who might be supplied cause with that conveniency, circumstances as you are. Especially when the excessive young man has got a friend stopping with him at a roar of sooner than he was expected from foreign ports. And it's too modest to want to be presented to the judge on his return, added Mr. Caggs. There was a short silence after which Toby Crackett seemed to abandon as hopeless any further effort to maintain his usual devil may care swagger, turned to Chitling and said, Well, what's back in the It was just at dinner time, two o'clock this afternoon. Charlie and I made our lucky up at the wash's chimney and both got out the empty water, but head downwards. But his legs was so precious long that they stuck out at the top, and so they took him too. Hey, Bet? Ah, poor Bet. She went to see the body to speak to who it was, replied Chilling, his countenance failing even more and more. They went off mad, screaming and raving and beating her head against the boards. So they put a straight whisket on her and took her to the hospital. And there she is. Who's come a young bitch? Demanded Keggs. He young, <clears throat> he young about not to come over here for dark. But he'll be here soon, replied Chitlin. He's no... There's nowhere else for him to go now, for the people at the cripples are all in custody. And the barber of the ken, I went up there to see it with my own eyes. It's filled with the traps. This is a smash, observed Toby, biting his lips. There's more than one there go with this. Could you say it's in your own, said Cags. If I get the inquest over... And Bota turns King's evidence, as of course he will. From what he said already, 
they can prove faking an accessory before the fact and get the trial on Friday and he'll swing in six days from this part code. You should have heard the people groan, said Chitlin. The officers fought like devils as they thrown him away. He was down once, but they made a ring round him and fought their way along. You should have seen how he looked about him, all muddy and bleeding. He clung to them as if they were his dearest friends. I can see him now, not able to stand upright with pressing of the mob, dragging along amongst them, and the people jumping up one behind another, snarling with their teeth and making him like wild beasts. I can see the blood upon his hands and beard and hear the cries with which the women wake themselves into the center of the crowd in the street corner. They swore they dare reside at. The horror-stricken witness of this scene pressed his hands upon his ears, and with his eyes closed, got up and paced violently to and fro like one distracted. While he was thus engaged, the two met, set in silence, with their eyes fixed upon the floor. A pattering noise was heard upon the stairs, and Sykes's dog bounded into the room. They ran to the window, downstairs, and into the street. The dog had jumped in at an open window, he made no attempt to follow them, nor was his master to be seen. What is the meaning of this? said Toby when they had returned. He can't be coming here. I, I hope not. We was coming here to come with the dog, said Keg, stooping down to examine the animal who lay panting on the floor. <laughs> Give us some water for him. He run himself faint. He's drunk it all up every drop, said Chitling after wit watching the dog some time in silence. Covered with mud, lame half blind. He must have come a long way. Where could he have come from? exclaimed Toby. He's been to the other kids, of course, and finally the film with strangers come here, where he's been many a time and often, where he can't have come from voice, and how comes he here alone without the other? He, none of them called the murderer by his old name, he can't just make away with himself. What do you think? Said Chillin. Toby shook his head. If he had, said Keggs. The dog had one to lead us away to where he did it. I don't think he's got out of country and left the dog behind. He must have given him the slip somehow or it wouldn't be so easy. This solution appeared the most probable one, was adopted as the right, and the dog, creeping under a chair, coiled himself up to a sleep without more notice from anybody. It is now dark. The shutter was closed, and a candle lighted and placed upon the table. The terrible events of the last two days had made a deep impression on all three, increased by the danger and uncertainty of their own position. They drew their chairs closer together, staring at every sound. They spoke little, and that in whispers, and were as silent and awe-stricken as if the remains of the murdered women lay in the next room. They had sat thus some time when suddenly was heard a hurried knocking at the door below. Young Bates, said Keggs, looking angrily around to check the fear he felt himself. The knocking came again. No, it wasn't he. He never knocked like that. Crackett went to the window and shaking all over, drew his head. There was no need to tell them who it was. His face was pale enough. The dog was on alert in an instant and ran whining to the door. We must let him in, he said, taking up a candle. Isn't there any help for it? asked the other man in a hoarse voice. None. He must come in. 
It don't leave us in the dark, said Keggs, turning down a candle from his chimney pipe and lighting it with such a trembling hand that the knocking was repeated twice before he had finished. Crackett went down to the door and returned, followed by a man with the lower part of his face buried in a handkerchief and the other tied over his head under his hat. He drew them slowly off. Blanched face, sunken eyes, hollow cheeks, beard of three days' growth, wasted flesh, short, thick breath. It was the very ghost of Sykes. I hate doing Sykes' voice. <laughs> he laid his hand upon a chair which stood in the middle of the room, but shuddering as he was about to drop into it and seeming to glance over his shoulder, dragged it back close to the wall, as close as it would go, ground it against it, and sat down. Not a word had been exchanged. He looked from one to another in silence. If an eye were furiously raised and met his, he was instantly averted. When his hollow voice broke silence, they all three started. They seemed never to have heard its tones before. How come that dog is here? He asked. Alone, three hours ago. The noise paper says that begging is taken. Is it true or you It's true. They were silent again. <coughs> Damn you all, said Sykes, passing his hand across his forehead. Have you nothing to say to me? There was an uneasy movement among them, but nobody spoke. Yeah, you can be out, says Sykes, turning his face to crack it. You mean to show me, or let me your head to this haunt is over? Hey, you, <clears throat> you may stop to think it's safe if you think it's safe, returned the person addressed after some hesitation. Sykes carried his eyes slowly up the wall behind him rather trying to turn his head than actually doing it, and said, Is it the body? Is it buried? They shook their heads. Why is it? He retorted with some glance behind him. What do I give you the ugly thing about your ground for? Who's that knocking? Crackett intimated by a motion of his hand as he left the room when there was nothing to fear, and came back with Charlie Bates behind him. Sykes sat opposite the door, so that the moment the boy entered the room, he encountered his figure. Joey, said the boy, following back, as Sykes turned his eyes up. Why is he so resistant? There had been something so tremendous in the shrinking off of the three that the wretched man was willing to appropriate even this lad. Accordingly, he nodded and made as though he would shake hands with him. You're going to some other room, said the boy, retreating still farther. Joy, said Sykes, stepping forward. Don't you, don't you know me? Don't come near me, answered the boy, still retreating and looking with horror in his eyes upon the murderer's face. He won't stop. The man stopped halfway and they looked at each other, but Sykes' eyes sank gradually into the ground. Witness you three, cried the boy, shaking his clenched fist and becoming more and more expired as he so. Witness you three, or oh, I'm not afraid of him. If they come here after him, I'll give him up for will. I'll tell you all at once. He may kill me for it if he yachts or if he dares, but if... Um, here, I'll give him up. I'll give him up if he wants to be boiled alive. Murder, help. If there's a pluck of a man among you three, you help me. Murder, help. Down with him. Pouring out these cries and accompanying them with a violent gesticulation, the boy actually threw himself single-handed upon the strong man 
and in the intensity of his energy and suddenness of surprise, brought him heavily to the ground. The three spectators seemed quite stupefied. They offered no interference, and the boy and the man rolled on the ground together, the former heedless of the blows that showered upon him, wrenching his hands tighter and tighter in the garments of the murderer's breast, never ceasing to call for help with all of his might. The contest, however, was too unequal to last long. Sykes had him down, and his knee was on his throat, and Crackett pulled him back with a little alarm and pointed to the window. There were lights gleaming below, voices in loud and earnest conversation, the tramp of hurried footsteps. Endlessly they seemed in number, crossing the nearest wooden bridge. One man on horseback seemed to be among the crowd, for there was the noise of hoofs, rattling on the uneven pavement. The gleam of lights increased. The footsteps came more thickly and noisily on. Then came a loud knocking at the door, and there a hoarse murmur from such a multitude of angry voices as would have made the boldest quail. Help! shrieked the voice. Shrieked the boy in a voice that rent the air. Easy knee, break your jaw down. In the king's name, cried the voices without. And the hoarse cry arose again, but louder. Break down your jaw, screamed the boy. I'll tell you, you'll never help it. Run strange in the room with your jaw. He's break down your jaw. Strokes thick and heavy rattled upon the door and lower window shutters as he ceased to speak, and the loud huzzah burst from the crowd, giving the listener, for the first time, some adequate idea of its immense extent. Oh, open your door, somebody's walking your disgrace in hell, babe, cried Sykes fiercely, running to and fro, and dragged the boy now as easily as if he were an empty sack. Yeah, go quick. He flung him in, bolted it, and turned the key. Easy down, say, go fast. Double locked and chained, replied Crackett, who among the other two men still remained quite helpless and bewildered. Ye panels are that strong. Lined with sheet iron. And you in those two. Yes, the and the windows. Damn you, cried the desperate ruffian, throwing up the sash and menacing the crowd. Do your wars down, cheat you yet. Of all the terrific yells that ever fell on mortal ears, none could exceed the cry of the infuriated throng. Shout, some shouted to those who were nearest to set the house on fire. Others roared to the officers to shoot him dead. Among them all, None showed such fury as the man on horseback who, throwing himself out of the saddle and bursting through the crowd as if he were parting water, cried beneath the window in a voice that rose above all others, Twenty guineas to the man who brings a ladder! The nearest voices took up the cry, and hundreds echoed it. Some called for ladders, some for sledgehammers, some ran with torches to and fro, as if to seek them, and still came back and roared again. Some spent their breath in impotent curses and excretions. Some pressed forward with ecstasy of madmen, and thus impeded the progress of those below. Some, among the boldest, attempted to climb up by the water spout and crevices in the wall, and all waved to and fro in the darkness beneath, like a field of corn, moved by an angry wind, and joined from time to time in one loud, furious roar. Ye joyed, cried the murderer as he sagged back into the room and shut the faces out. Ye joyed was in as you came up. Give me a rope, a young rope, they were in front. Or may drop into the forty ditch and clear off that way. Give me a rope, or I think you feel more murdered and kill myself at last. 
<coughs> the panic-stricken men pointed to where such articles were kept. The murderer, hastily selecting the longest and strongest cord, hurried up to the housetop. All the windows in the rear of the house had been long ago bricked up, except one small trap in the room where the boy was locked, and that was too small even for the passage of his body. But from this aperture, he had never ceased to call on those without to guard the back. And thus, when the murderer emerged at last on the housetop by the door in the roof, a sh loud shout proclaimed that he was in... A loud shout proclaimed the fact to those in front, who immediately began to pour around, pressing each other in one unbroken stream. He planted a board, which he carried up with him for the purpose, so firmly against the door, that it must be a matter of great difficulty to open it from the inside, and creeping over the tiles, looked over the low parapet. Water was out, in the ditch a bed of mud. The crowd had been hushed during these few moments, watching his motions and doubtful of his purpose. But the instant they perceived it and knew it was defeated, they raised a cry of triumphant excretion, to which all previous shouting had been whispers. Again and again it rose. Oh. Those who were too great a distance to know its meaning took up the sound and echoed and re-echoed. It seemed as though the whole city had poured its population out to curse him. On pressed the people from the front, on, 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 in a strong struggling current of angry faces. And here and there, a glaring torch was lit up and shoo them out in all their wrath and passion. The houses on the opposite side of the ditch had been entered by the mob. Sashes were thrown up, were torn boldly out. There were tears and tears of faces in every window, and cluster upon cluster of people clinging to every housetop. Each little bridge, and there were three in sight, bent beneath the weight of the crowd upon it. Still the current poured on to find some nook or hole from which to vent their shouts, and only for an instant see the wretch. Let him know, cried a man on the nearest bridge. Hurrah! The crowd grew light with uncovered heads, and again the shout uprose. I promise fifty pounds, cried an old gentleman from the same quarter. Fifty pounds to the man who takes him alive. I will remain here till he comes to ask me for it. There was another roar. At this moment, the word was passed among the crowd that the door was forced at last, and that he who had first called for the ladder had mounted into the room. The stream abruptly turned it as this intelligence ran from mouth to mouth, and the people at the windows, seeing those upon the bridges pouring back quitted their stations, and running into the street, joined the concourse that now thronged pell-mell to the spot they had left. Each man, crushing and striving with his neighbor, and all panting with impotence to get near the door and look upon the criminal as the officers brought him out, the cries and shrieks of those who were pressed almost to suffocation or trampled down and trodden underfoot in the confusion were dreadful. The narrow ways were completely blocked up, and at this time, between the rush of some to regain the space in front of the house and the unavailing struggles of others to extricate themselves from the mass, the immediate attention was distracted from the murderer, although the universal eagerness for his capture was, if possible, increased. The man had shrunk down, thoroughly quelled by the ferocity of the crowd, 
and the impossibility of escape was seeing this sudden charge with no less rapidity than it had occurred, he sprung upon his feet, determined to make one last effort for his life by dropping into the ditch and, at the risk of being stifled, endeavoring to creep away in the darkness and confusion. Roused into new strength and energy and stimulated by the noise within the house which announced the entrance had really been effected, he set his foot against the stack of chimneys, fastened one end of the rope tightly and firmly round it, and with the other made a strong running noose by the aid of his hands and teeth. Almost in a second, he could let himself down by the cord to within less distance of the ground than his own height, and had his knife ready in his hand to cut it and then drop. At the very instant when he brought the loop over his head previous to slipping it beneath his armpits, and when the old gentleman before mentioned, who had clung so tight to the railing of the bridge as if to resist the force of the crowd and retain his position, earnestly warned those about him that the man was about to lower himself down. At that very instant, the murderer, looking behind him on the roof, threw his arms above his head and uttered a yell of terror. You're the gang, he cried in an unearthly screech. Staggering as if struck by lightning, he lost his balance and tumbled over the parapet. The noose was at his neck. It ran up with his weight, tight as a bowstring, and swift as the arrow it speeds. He fell for five and thirty feet. There was a sudden jerk a terrific convulsion of the limbs, and there he hung with the open night clenched in his stiffening hand. The old chimney quivered with the shock, but it stood bravely. The murderer swung lifeless against the wall, and the boy, thrusting aside the dangling body which obscured his view, called to the people to come and take him out for God's sake. The dog, which had lain concealed until now, ran backwards and forwards on the parapet with a dismal howl, and collecting himself for a spring, jumped for the dead man's shoulders. Missing his aim, he fell into the ditch, turning completely over as he went, and striking his head against a stone, bashed out his brain. Wow, that's really sad way to end the chapter. <laughs> oh boy. Um, well, well, we've only got like 25 pages left. We're at chapter 51, porting an explanation of more mysteries than one and comprehending a proposal of marriage with no word of settlement or pin money. Uh, here's the last illustration of Mr. Bill Sykes. There will be no more Bill Sykes, which kind of terrible because he had to take his dog with him. Not just that, he, he took his dog with him and he... Um, Thank you so much for tuning in. Appreciate your time, brain power, and energy. Uh, if you enjoyed the vid, please like, share, subscribe. Um, like I said, I'm planning on combining these also. It'll probably be like a whole, you know, day worth of Oliver Twist reading. <laughs> uh, but that's it. Definitely appreciate everyone showing up tonight once again. One love. Jalo, ja